Good morning, everyone, and welcome to this, the last service of June, and the last service before our summer schedule. <clears throat> and we have a very special service plan to mark the occasion for you. So once again, thank you for joining us. My name's Norm Horofker, and I'm the minister of this congregation, the Universalist Unitarian Church of Halifax. Jessica Friesen is our music director. Marie-Claude LaRue is our director of religious exploration. Uh, the RE program for our children and youth is in hiatus now until the fall. John Piccolo is our volunteer director and technician, and we have two very special guests this morning that you'll meet in due course. During the service today, the chat function will be open, and I invite you to extend our hospitality by saying hello to anyone and everyone that you don't recognize. If you're not already receiving notifications from our church, and you'd like to receive updates on our activities and our services, please send an email to minister at uuch.ca. The announcements are in the order of service that went out uh, last night to everyone, and I, I'm going to have to refer you there for the details. Now, our Truth and Reconciliation Acknowledgement. Today, and in each service, we pause to acknowledge that we are on unceded Mi'kmaq territory. This morning, I'm delighted to have Warren Dalkeith with us. Warren lives in the neighborhood, and I've got to know him over the past couple of years. Warren is of Ojibwe descent from the province of Manitoba. And he recited a poem for me once uh, in my office, and I asked him if he'd be willing to share that with the congregation. So this morning he has a, that poem to share with us. It's a poem called, A New Evolution. Warren. Good morning. Black man, white man, colored man, woman, we the people are all created equal. Rich man, poor man, strong man, weak man, we the people are all created equal. Look at our world full of violence and hate. Our culture, our species is so irate. The countries we conquer, the countries we defend, if we don't stop this soon, this could all mean an end. We are a species that hurts our young. We are the only species that kills for fun. With money and greed that go hand in hand as we cut our trees, poisoning our precious land. Some say we're on the verge of destruction, but I believe we're on the brink of evolution. For we the people must correct our wrongs, and we the people must repair our songs, and we the people are looking for a new evolution. Lest we forget the faces of our fathers, lest we forget the faces of our mothers, may we never forget the faces of our heroes. Lest we forget the faces of our fallen, lest we forget the faces of our loved ones, lest we forget the faces of our children, but lest we forget the faces of ourselves in this new evolution. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Warren. <clears throat> this congregation has undertaken a number of initiatives to help us to learn the hard truths of our history. We currently are planning our way forward for the fall and if you'd like to be a part of the healing of our relationships with our Indigenous peoples, please contact me. I'm busy, but not too busy for this work. I need a community around me to remind me of what is important, and I think you do too. Amen. And now Jessica will help us to relax for a moment as we enter into this, into this sacred space of community that is our Sunday worship. Good morning, everyone. Uh, for the prelude, I have chosen uh, the spiritual, traditional spiritual Swing Low Sweet Chariot. I just want to recognize uh, the arrangement of this piece, and it's by Teresa Wilhelmi. Uh, so please enjoy. It's a really fun piece. <laughs>
Thank you. And now we'll light our chalice as we do every Sunday, signifying the beginning <coughs> of our service. Today, our special guest, Mr. Joe Jenks, will lead us with words and song for our chalice lighting, live from his studio in DeKalb, Illinois. Joe? Thank you so much, and what an honor it is to be here with you. Just double tech, checking the tech here. Um, this is a song called Flame in the Darkness, which seems appropriate to our chalice lighting and normal light the chalice there while I sing.
I light the chalice this morning here in our sanctuary, anticipating the day when we'll return here to this special place to be together. Now we have another special treat. Our time for children of all ages will be presented this morning by Joe Jenks. Joe will follow the time of all ages with our opening hymn. And in case you're wondering, I'll be introducing Joe more properly shortly. Joe, take it away. Thank you. Um... One of the privileges I have as a touring musician is that I occasionally end up in an educational environment in a school where I have the opportunity to lead a songwriting workshop. And several years ago, I was out in Washington State in the Columbia River Valley, where a lot of uh, fruit is grown in the United States, uh, apples and peaches and cherries and apricots and um, uh, a very fertile valley, uh, the Columbia River Valley. And uh, it is the home to many, many people involved in agriculture, including many itinerant and migrant laborers, um, many of whom do not speak English as their first language. And I was invited into a classroom to uh, do songwriting with some high school students who did not speak English uh, particularly well, some of them not at all. And I thought, well, this is going to be interesting. I, I have the opportunity to figure out if music truly is a universal language. And indeed it is. Uh, the assignment was for the students to write their thoughts, their ideas in Spanish, and then to translate them into English. And then I got to take their English translation and work with them. Uh, and we did this real time um, over the arc of a couple hours in the classroom. But this was the song that came out the other side. And it it's called Adonde Pertenesco, Where Do I Belong? Where is my place? To where do I pertain? And uh, I think it's a question that we ask a lot throughout our lives, um, particularly in our teen years. We ask this question a lot. How, how do I fit into this world? Where, where is my place of relevance? What's my role? But I think sometimes we suffer the illusion that we will grow out of that and have a clearer sense but I think if we're being honest with ourselves, at every stage of our life, at every age, we're still asking that question, where do I belong? Where is my place? To where do I pertain? And especially as things have changed around us so much in the last several months, as we've had to learn how to do old activities in new ways, in so many different aspects of our lives, we've all been asking this question, where do I belong? Where is my place? If my identity was going to work or my identity was going to school or my identity was doing particular things in the community in a very particular way, what's my job now? What's my role now? Where do I belong? Adonde pertenezco? Better life. 
vai para buscar uma vida melhor, vida melhor. We are looking for communities, buscando comunidades. Better opportunities, con mejores oportunidades. But who have we left behind? A quienes hemos dejado atrás, dejado atrás. Donde pertenezco? Where do I come from? De donde vengo? Where will I go from here? Para donde iré de aquí? They are wish you good luck figuring out where your place is in this new world. Just switch instruments here. This is a hymn that you are probably all familiar with. Uh, so I encourage you from home or wherever you happen to be to, to sing along with me on this. One of my favorite songs. Um, I had heard this growing up in church. And then my sister gave me a, a Pete Seeger record. And Pete Seeger sang this song on the record. And I remember going to uh, my mom and saying, Mom, why is Pete singing a church song? And I, of course, spent a lot of years of my life understanding the interplay between the work of social justice and the abolitionist movement and uh, different efforts over the years where uh, people of faith and people of conscience and um, uh, people who were aligned with various social justice causes um, had points of great intersectionality. And in fact, so many people experience their faith as a call, as a mandate to work for justice in the world. And I know most of us here certainly have that sense, which is part of why we find ourselves gathering this morning as Unitarian Universalists. Um, and guests, of course. Jessica, thanks for that wonderful prelude. Very nice. Please sing with me. How can I keep from singing? My life flows on in endless song. Of earth's lamentation, I hear that real though far off hymn that hails the new creation. Through all the tumult and the strife, I hear that music ringing. The 
It sounds an echo in my soul How can I keep from singing? How can I keep from singing? But though the tempest round me roar I hear the truth it liveth But though the darkness round me close Songs in the night it giveth No storm can shake my inmost calm While to that rock I'm clinging Since love is Lord of heaven and earth how can I keep from singing? How can I keep from singing? When tyrants tremble sick with fear And hear their death knells ringing when friends rejoice both far and near How can I keep from singing In prison cells and dungeon vile Our thoughts to them are winging When friends by shame are undefiled how can I keep from singing? How can I keep from singing? My life flows on. My life flows on in endless song. Above earth's lamentation. I hear that real, though far off him, that hails the new creation. Through all the tumult and the strife, I hear that music ringing. It sounds an echo in my soul. How can I keep from singing? It sounds an echo in my soul. How can I keep from singing? It sounds an echo in my soul. How can I keep from singing? How can I keep from singing? Thank you. We take, uh, set aside a special time now to reflect on our joys and sorrows. This is a sacred time in our service. It's a time that we set apart to honor the many joys and the many sorrows that you, the congregation, are living and to acknowledge the mutual support of our community. Each week, I invite anyone with a joy or a sorrow to share at this time to relay their thoughts to me by email. I'd like to begin this morning by lighting a candle of celebration for Peter Ono, who turned 85 years of age on Wednesday, June 24th. I know Peter had a quiet celebration with friends on that day, which is all <clears throat> that we're allowed in these times of social isolation. But Peter and Mary Ellen, we are thinking of you.
And Warren Dalkeith, who shared his poetry with us earlier, would like to light a candle. And I invite Warren to light a candle now. Come right up here. And now I'd like to light a candle in a memory that we're all cherishing of Allison Shipman. And I have a picture to share of Allison that captures so much of her spirit. Allison died on the evening of June 25th, three weeks after arriving at the Halifax hospice. She appreciated so much. She died peacefully surrounded by the love of her brother, Steve, and his wife, Mary, and her dear friend, Sass Menard, as well as her special staff at hospice. Allison will be greatly missed by all who were fortunate enough to know her. Her ashes will be interred in a small family service on Monday, and uh, it's expected that we'll have a celebration of life later in the year when we're allowed to gather in a larger group. Later today, uh, when we stop live streaming on YouTube and before the coffee hour begins, I'll invite anyone else to share a joy or a sorrow if they would like to do so. And now Jessica will provide some music for a time of reflection. May the joys and the sorrows, both those acknowledged here this morning and those held in the silent sanctuary of our hearts, weave us together in the interdependent fabric that is our community. And now I'd like to invite Marilyn Chenier for a reading that Joe Jenks has selected to lead his message to us today. Marilyn? On Freedom by Khalil Gibran. At the city gate and by your fireside, I have seen you prostrate yourself and worship your own freedom, even as slaves humble themselves before a tyrant and praise him, though he slays them. I, in the grove of the temple and in the shadow of the citadel, I have seen the freest among you wear their freedom as a yoke and a handcuff. And my heart bled within me, for you can only be free when even the desire of seeking freedom becomes a harness to you, and when you cease to speak of freedom as a goal and a fulfillment. 
You shall be free indeed when your days are not without a care, nor your nights without a want and a grief. But rather when these things girdle your life, and yet you rise above them, naked and unbound. And how shall you rise beyond your days and your nights, unless you break the chains which you at the dawn of your understanding have fastened around your noon hour? In truth, that which you call freedom is the strongest of these chains, though its links glitter in the sun and dazzle your eyes. And what is it but fragments of your own self you would discard that you may become free? If it is an unjust law you would abolish, that law was written with your own hand upon your own forehead. You cannot erase it by burning your law books, nor by washing the foreheads of your judges, though you pour the sea upon them. And if it is a despot you would dethrone, see first that his throne erected within you is destroyed. For how can a tyrant rule the free and the proud, but for a tyranny in their own freedom and a shame in their own pride? And if it is a care that you would cast off, that care has been chosen by you rather than imposed upon you. And if, it's, and if it is a fear that you would dispel, the seat of that fear is in your heart and not in the hand of the feared. Thank you, Marilyn. Yeah, thank you, beautifully read. And now I get to properly introduce the gentleman who has been capturing your imagination with word and music in this service already. I first heard of uh, Joe Jenks when our congregation's own after choir band <laughs> played his tribute, a uh, beautiful music that he had written, a tribute to Pete Seeger called Let Me Sing You a Song. And that was enough to make me a devoted fan. But since then, I've learned so much more. Joe is a 20 year veteran of the International Folk Circuit, an award winning songwriter and a celebrated vocalist with his base in Chicago. Merging conservatory training with his Irish roots and working class upbringing, Joe delivers engaged musical narratives filled with heart and soul and groove and grit. Joe is noted for his unique merging of musical beauty, social conscience and spiritual exploration blending well-crafted instrumentals with vivid songwritings. And Joe, I'm proud to say, is a Unitarian Universalist who seriously considered entering the ministry before he realized that music was his ministry. It's a great pleasure to welcome Joe to this virtual format in Halifax and to dream of the day when he can come here in person to spread the good news of his music. Joe has titled his message for us today Forgiveness and Other Acts of Radical Love. Joe? Thank you so much. Um, let me say what an extraordinary pleasure and privilege it is to be with all of you this morning. Uh, I would like to acknowledge that I live in DeKalb County in Illinois, west of Chicago, and that I live on lands that were traditionally the home of the Potawatomi and the Ottawa peoples. Uh, I'll start out with a song written by my friend John Brooks in Toronto, a song that has become a bit of a personal theme for me, and um, a song that was for me salvation unto itself when I first heard it, and uh, it's called Simply Mercy. And all it could do with love and words I used to admire most a poet who With a pen untangled this world into verse 
I used to admire all that I thought profound I plagiarized the prophets and the saints Oh, but now Now that I'm older Oh, it's mercy that I admire most Oh, it's mercy that I admire most I waited out my low youth for a fathom spectacle. Nine snaking round coliseums. I moshed in the drench under fame's softest clenched. And I paid hard earned money just to see him. Oh, but now, now that I'm older, oh. Mercy that I admire most. Oh, it's mercy that I admire most. I admire the pure of heart that will one thing. I admire the steady in their routine. I admire decision and the mind that endures it, and those who speak though they be shamed. I admire the reckless voices for the voiceless, and the man standing in the path of tanks. Oh, but now, now that I'm older, oh, it's mercy that I admire most. Oh, it's mercy that I admire most. Oh, it's mercy. I always like to start out by acknowledging that I, I am not an ordained minister. Um, I am a poet and a writer, a musician, a human being with a big heart and a lot of ideas, some of which you may agree with, some of which may challenge you. Uh, I carry no particular weight of authority other than my own perspective and lived experience, and I share it with you. Um, I start out with uh, a poem by Hafez called Tripping Over Joy. What is the difference between your experience of existence and that of a saint? The saint knows that the spiritual path is a sublime chess game with God, and that the beloved has just made such a fantastic move that the saint is now continually tripping over joy and bursting out in laughter and saying, I surrender. Where is you, my dear? I am afraid you still think you have a thousand serious moves. <laughs> Forgiveness is an essential part of moving through the world and finding that joy that Hafez talks about, the saint who is tripping over joy. <clears throat> saint Peter in Christian scripture says, Lord, if my brother sins against me, how often must I forgive him? As many as seven times. And Jesus answered, I say to you, not seven times, but seventy times, seven times. Rumi, in the UU hymnal, we even have a hymn that uses these words. Come, come, whoever you are, wanderer, worshiper, lover of leaving. It doesn't matter. Ours is not a caravan of despair. Come, even if you have broken your vow a thousand times, come yet again, come, come. When I started pondering the idea of speaking to you this morning, 
about forgiveness. I thought this could be a short sermon. I'm, I was raised Irish Catholic. I have Swedish and French Canadian Quebecois ancestry. Uh, what this tells me is that there's a fair chance I will live a long life and hold a lot of grudges. So uh, it, is, it is clearly my work to do in this lifetime, to work on the idea of releasing burdens, releasing animosity, releasing resentments, and working on forgiveness. But the more I thought about it, the more I realized that the seeds of this practice were buried deep within the tradition I was raised in, uh, in a prayer that unites not just people of the Christian faith, but many people of different spiritual practices around the globe. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. In the very foundational prayer of an entire faith are the words, forgiveness are the ideas of forgiveness, are the ideas that we cannot be released unless we are also willing to release others, that we cannot release others on some level unless we're willing to release ourselves. And compassion for the self and permissiveness of harmful behaviors aren't the same thing, though we sometimes get confused about that. But elementally, I think forgiveness is a personal act of redemption. And I think sometimes as Unitarian Universalists, we struggle with understanding what redemption means for us. And I think forgiveness is a pathway into that understanding. Deconstructing a practice of forgiveness is a pathway into that. There are so many things going on around us in our society, in Canada, in the U.S., globally, um, where entire peoples have to figure out what forgiveness looks like between each other where the sins of the past must be reconciled in some fashion. And it's not an easy thing to do because so often it is the oppressed, the aggrieved party that is asked to lead with forgiveness for the colonial power, for the oppressor, for the society that has marginalized its own, that has conquered another, that has in some way, for the sake of progress, decided that it's okay to roll over some of these aspects of history. So when the wound runs so deep, what does forgiveness look like? How do we find our place in a practice that is so difficult and yet so elemental? But I submit to you that forgiveness, like love, is a verb, to forgive, to love. And as we embrace the idea of forgiveness as a verb, I think we begin to find our pathway into the practice, and it is a practice. Uh, we call it a practice because we haven't perfected it yet. We keep practicing. A traditional Christian perspective on redemption uh, often has us thinking about the idea of forgiveness coming only through some form of supplication to the divine, that it is only through the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross, that redemption is purchased. And yet Jesus spoke so freely of forgiveness. And it was that radical forgiveness that paved the way for so much radical love and inclusiveness. Universalist theology has a very different view on the idea of salvation. We would say that, um, that salvation is a universal principle, not unlike gravity. Um, you don't have to believe in it to be bound by it. Uh, not unlike sunlight, it shines whether you believe in the sun or not. The sun continues to shine. And uh, there is nothing we can do to earn the sunlight. There's nothing we can do to push the sunlight away. It shines independently of us. We can choose to stand in the light or we can choose to stand in the shadow. But we have no power over the sunlight. And there's nothing we can do that is so great that we earn the sunlight there's nothing we can do so terrible that we stop receiving the sunlight. That's the idea of universal salvation, that the power of divine love is so pervasive, it is fundamentally unavoidable, that it eventually wears us down. 
And um, I think that's a really important idea. There were two Buddhist monks, stop me if you've heard this one. There were two Buddhist monks walking between monasteries one day and they came upon a, a stream and there was a young woman by the stream and she was weeping and wailing. They'd had a recent rain and the floodwaters had risen and she was quite distressed. And <clears throat> the monk stopped her and uh, asked her what was wrong. And she explained that there had been a, a tragedy, a loss in the family, and she needed to get word to a neighboring village so that people could come and grieve together. But she didn't know how to swim. And the elder of the two Buddhist monks um, simply picked her up and placed her on his shoulders. Now their order had a tenant that they were strictly to have no contact with women for any reason. And the younger monk of the two didn't know that the elder monk about every 10 years would go back and begin again with a new class of novitiates and go through the trainings again, not just to refresh himself, but to see the trainings and the teachings, to see the Dharma through the lens of beginners because he learned something new every time. And so he was quite advanced in his practice, and yet he understood that the heart of the practice is always elemental. The heart of the practice is always in a very particular place. And he picked the young woman up, placed her on his shoulders, and carried her across the river. He set her down on the other side, and she thanked them both profusely and ran off. The two monks walked for a good two miles, and the younger of the two was clearly furious. The anger and frustration was pouring off of him. It was palpable in the air around him. And finally, the elder monk said, Brother, do you have something to say? And the younger monk at that invitation went off on a tirade about how could this elder monk with so many years of practice still, you know, miss the core of the teachings and why did he choose to have contact with a woman and, you know, just on and on and on, just unleashing this, this angst that he'd been carrying. And the elder monk listened for a spell. And then he looked at the younger monk and he said, my brother, I left the woman by the river. Why are you still carrying her? I think about this a lot. I ask myself, what burdens am I carrying that I really need to let go of? What places in my life am I continuing to hold a place for the darkness of my own anger and my own frustration and my need for <sighs> retribution in some way, perhaps vengeance? Not words I use freely or lightly, words that are hard for me to even say. And yet somewhere in my heart, my sense of justice as a young person started to tune itself around the idea that justice only exists if somebody else gets theirs. And this isn't really a spiritual principle that's sustainable. And I think there is, there's a deep spiritual ecology at play. We look at the natural world around us and we see a certain kind of efficiency in that world. Uh, I knew a cat that had only two legs once, and it got up bipedal. It tucked its hindquarters underneath itself, and it would get up and move bipedal on its front two legs. It took a little while to find its stability, and then it, would, it, it had one speed, which was fast, and that's how it could sustain movement on only two legs. And I asked its keeper uh, about the history of the animal, and, and she said, well, the cat was born that way, and it just learned how to walk with only two legs. And... Um, and she said, do you know why the cat's able to do that? I said, no, why? She said, because the cat does not judge itself for being less than someone else. The cat simply works with what it has. It does not know self-pity. It simply knows that there's something on the other side of the room at once, and it figures out how to get there. And I thought about that, and I thought about the ways in which the resentments that we harbor are tied in to our inability or unwillingness to forgive. But I think that we have the possibility of being redemption for each other. When we wonder what does salvation look like for Unitarian Universalism, what does redemption look like for us? I think forgiveness is a big part of it. And we have the opportunity to be redemption for each other. In the Gospels, Jesus says, 
Christian Gospels, to be clear. What Jesus says is, whatever you set loose on earth, it shall be loosened in heaven. And whatever you hold bound on earth, it will be held bound in heaven. I don't think of this in terms of heaven and hell. I don't think of it in terms of, you know, God up here and us down here. I think we are all intermingled and intermixed. And what we held bound in our heart, we carry with us. And the burden of that harms us. The reason for learning how to engage in forgiveness is something that has multiple layers of goodness that ripple outward. It's a gift to ourselves and to others. We have to forgive other people because ultimately the poison of that is something that affects us. Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King said that hate is a chain with a prisoner at both ends. I've heard it said that harboring resentment is like drinking a cup of poison and expecting it to harm someone else. My own faith journey away from Catholicism, through Buddhism, through many spiritual practices, and ultimately into the Unitarian Universalist tradition was one of drinking a cup of poison of resentment against the faith of my childhood for the things that it had done poorly. This massive institution that cannot possibly be quantified in whole. It is composed of many extraordinary and loving and giving people in complex relationships with others that are attached to very specific traditions. And I had known many clergy, many priests, many nuns who were just extraordinary people, extraordinarily giving people, people who changed the direction of my life, people who educated me in deep spiritual practice. And so I've never been able to vilify an institution because I know so many people inside of it that are doing extraordinary work, work of faith, work of spirit, work of humanity. And yet I held this anger and this resentment in my heart for so many years. And at one point I realized that my anger at the institution that contained the faith of my childhood, and I separate the institution from the faith, but my anger at the institution was preventing me from loving deeply in the world in a way that I needed to love. And I needed to recognize that that anger that I held within me was not harming the institution in any way. The institution was entirely oblivious to my anger. <laughs> but it was harming me. And I realized in that moment that forgiveness is a gift to ourselves. People may not understand that they have caused us harm, and sometimes there may be no point in confronting someone or talking with them about it, and yet we still have to do the work of forgiveness because it is causing us harm. And I think just as we must offer forgiveness, we also have to be willing to receive sincere apologies when someone approaches us and tries to make amends for something that they feel like they have done. I have had the experience more often than not of someone apologizing to me for something that I was not even aware that they had done or that I did not perceive as having caused me harm. I, it happened at a time when I was just able to go, well, there's someone's humanity showing. Uh, may they be gracious with another. Um, you know, it, it didn't, really, didn't really bother me, but sometimes people do approach us. And I think it's important to begin to deconstruct what does it mean to offer a sincere apology? What does it mean to receive one? One of the questions that we have to ask ourselves is how would we know something had changed? By what mark, by what measure would we understand that something was different? If you had harmed me and you came to me with an awareness that something had gone wrong, that something was amiss, that we were not in right relation. How would I know that there was some true reconciliation? Simply saying, I'm sorry, or I forgive you, that's the beginning of a practice. That's the beginning of the road to healing. It isn't the destination. So I think it's important to learn how to offer an honest apology and how to receive one. 
there's a phrase in uh, in 12 step circles uh, you can level with someone without leveling them i think it's important to be in relationship with our own anger so that we're not um, we're not making things worse in an effort to try and make things better if you are not ready to offer forgiveness be aware of that don't fake it if somebody comes to you and asks for forgiveness you can kindly acknowledge the effort and also kindly acknowledge that you are still wrestling with something and you can begin a process of healing you don't have to pretend everything's okay if it's not and I think this is particularly important right now in society because there are so many people there are so many people in this world that have been asked for centuries as people as 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 an identity as a community uh, indigenous people people that were affected by colonialism people who were transported to this continent and to the Americas as slaves there are people who are asked to offer forgiveness when there has not been an honest effort at reconciliation there are people that are asked to offer forgiveness again and again when they in fact are the aggrieved party so offering an apology or asking for forgiveness that's a great place to start but it's the beginning of the conversation not the end of it if you are in conflict be prepared to let someone know that you still feel harmed but again you can do that and be kind about it if they offer an honest apology let that be the first step in a larger conversation and we have to actually be prepared to forgive and I know this may seem elemental but like the elder Buddhist monk going back to the beginning of the practice we have to arrive at a place where we're actually willing to forgive another person not just receive some satisfaction because of their supplication because they have humbled themselves enough to say they're sorry we actually have to do it Dorothy Day the founder of the Catholic worker movement practiced a very radical kind of hospitality radical love and she helped so many people beginning in the Great Depression and moving forward and uh, was a maverick throughout her life frequently in trouble with the institutions she worked with and um, upon her deathbed she said do not make me a saint I come back to the Hafez what the saint knows and we don't she said do not make me a saint to do so suggests that I have done something beyond the capacity of other human beings I have not all I have done is love radically and I think forgiveness is a form of love I think we need to be prepared that if we approach another person and ask for forgiveness the first thing we may encounter is their anger because they feel harmed and I think that's one of the things we're grappling with in society right now is that there are people when even extended a hand of apology what comes out first is anger and we don't know what to do with anger I don't, I don't have a magic wand I don't have the ability to just suddenly transform myself into a person who is comfortable with anger but it's part of the work I have to learn how to accept that I'm part of a system that has caused extraordinary harm to many many people and I have to be willing to receive that anger as a spiritual practice as the opening of the door into a deeper dialogue just as I have to embrace my own anger when somebody comes to me to apologize and shockingly my first response isn't relief it's outrage because I finally have permission to go you so and so you did this and you did that and that doesn't really solve anything I need to be able to accept that anger is sometimes a part of reconciliation and I think it gets scary for all of us because we're afraid we're afraid of being outcast we're afraid of being ostracized we're afraid of doing things wrong we're afraid of harming other people and when it comes to our attention that we have in some way caused harm to another there's a certain sense of shame that emerges forgiveness is not magic though it is miraculous 
And I think it's easy in our society to say, well, this is, this is extraordinary work. This should be the realm of the minister, of the doctor, of the politician, the artist, the soldier, the architect, the teacher, the prophet. But I think, for me, like the idea of Christian salvation that hinges everything on the sacrifice that Jesus made on the cross. The problem with that view of redemption, that view of salvation, that view of forgiveness, is that it does exactly what Dorothy Day asked us not to do. It turns those that have this capacity into saints, into somehow other than ourselves, to people that we elevate, and it lets us off the hook from doing the deep spiritual work that's required. And I think that this work is within the capacity of all of us to do. We can engage in forgiveness and other radical acts of love. And we can do this because we have seen so many examples of ordinary people do extraordinary things. We are strong enough. We are smart enough. We are capable enough. Radical love can offer the world a kind of healing that is so needed, but it can also do wonders one-on-one -on -one in relationships. We get better at forgiveness as we practice forgiveness. It's like any other skill set we acquire. It's knowable, it's learnable, and we get better at it the more we do it. We may not find all of the wholeness we are seeking immediately in this practice of forgiveness, but we will find that we are moving in the right direction. And as we learn how to do more, we will do more. Maya Angelou, who was Poet Laureate for the United States for many years, said, we can only work with what we know, but once we know better, we've got to do better. Reverend Dr. Martin, right, tongue -tied, Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King had some very strong ideas about the correlation between forgiveness and nonviolent resistance, and he understood forgiveness as a spiritual practice. He said, we must develop and maintain the capacity to forgive. He who is devoid of the power to forgive is devoid of the power to love. There is some good in the worst of us and some evil in the best of us. When we discover this, we are less prone to hate our enemies. At another point, he was asked to talk about nonviolence as a practice, as a philosophy, as a political idea. And he said this, nonviolence does not mean just refusing to kill a man. It means refusing to hate a man. Nonviolence is a spiritual practice. It is a refusal to hate. It is a choice when we feel that anger rise within us, that response of frustration, of outrage, to embrace the feelings and then choose to gently deconstruct them so as not to cause further harm. This is a song I wrote on the 50th anniversary of Martin Luther King's assassination. It's called simply Martin. Another preacher's kid singing in the choir. This kid had a vision, preach for something higher. Six years old when segregation put him in his place. Started school and lost his childhood friends. Questioning the order of society and faith. Many deeper truths which one cannot escape. Martin, oh Martin Luther King, keep holding on to what you know is true. Living out the 
teachings continuing to sing Martin oh Martin Luther King Booker T. Washington High School was the place he began to raise his voice on poverty and race headed off to Morehouse a 15 year old sage chasing dreams of dignity beyond his youthful age Martin Oh, Martin Luther King, keep speaking up for what you know is true. Living out the teachings, continuing to sing. Martin, oh, Martin Luther King, studying the sacred word challenged him to grow. Headed for Montgomery. Toward a fate he could not know City buses, boycotts, peaceful marches in the street A bomb thrown through a window Crowd of thorns laid at his feet Albany to Birmingham, St. Augustine to Selma Boston, New York City Chicago and D.C. Carrying the burden and the banner of equality Till 1968, April 4th Memphis, Tennessee Martin, oh Martin Luther King We will speak for what we know is true Living out your teachings, continuing to sing Martin, oh Martin Luther King Martin, oh Martin Luther King We will speak for what we know is true Living out your teachings, continuing to sing Martin, oh Martin Luther King Living out your teachings Continuing to sing Martin, oh Martin Luther King Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Thank you. It's been a joy and a privilege to have Joe Jenks join us for this morning's service. One thing that we've learned in this pandemic is that our online services present us with an opportunity to experience and support financially and otherwise people who devote their lives to music for our benefit. Our offering presents us with a time of ritual, a time to celebrate the importance of generosity and leading a good life and the congregation has responded again and again to this call. This message from the board of this church. In this trying time, your generous donations to our Saturday brunch and the minister's discretionary fund have been amazing. Those two funds are doing well. However, it seems likely that our total income for the year will be down as both fundraising events and the occasional space rentals are unlikely. It's also possible that some people will be unable to meet their pledges due to the financial ramifications of the COVID-19 virus. So even though some expenses will also be down, we may be facing a deficit this year. If you'd like to assist with this, please consider increasing your monthly pledge or occasionally making an unpledged donation. You can do it by e-transfer to treasurer at uuch.ca. If you prefer to do this by check, you can mail the check to the church address. This with gratitude from your board of directors. The closing words this morning are also the words for extinguishing the chalice. They're a reprise of the final stanza of the song composed by Joe Jenks that he sang for the chalice lighting. But they're perfect now. 
Joe wrote, there's a flame in the darkness burning deep within our hearts. In the love that grows between us, this is where the journey starts. There's hope in the stillness, there's solace in our friends, in the love that flows between us, the sacred journey never ends. May this sacred journey never end. So we'll now present our closing hymn. I love the fact that that flame didn't quite want to go out. That feels somehow <laughs> symbolic. That's lovely. Uh, Reverend Norm, thank you so much for having me here as a guest. Thank you to the congregation. Thanks to Jessica uh, for that beautiful music uh, and to John for all the tech support. And I hope I get to see you all in person someday soon. This is a song called Come With Me. I wrote this uh, after nearly drowning in a river in Northern California, which is not as much fun as it might sound like. And um, uh, I really sort of had a deep fear placed into me and an awareness of how much we need each other. Um, it was a moment when I was afraid to ask for help, when pride got the better of me. And I also used to be a Red Cross certified lifeguard and a strong swimmer. And, I failed to recognize that that sense of self was easily 10 years out of date. And, um, and to my eternal benefit, there was a woman on a retreat that week who was a current Red Cross certified lifeguard, and she got in the water with me. But rather than doing all the lifeguard maneuvers that I had been trained in years before, she simply started to tread water and to pl uh, invited me to place my hands on her shoulders, and she held me up in that torrent. And she told me to take a deep breath. I invite you to take one of those deep breaths, or two or three. <sighs> Connected to your center, sing with me as you wish from home. Will you come with me on this journey? I feel the current raging around me trying to summon up my strength once more I am weary on this journey afraid I will not reach that distant shore I cry for help feel like I'm sinking there is no one near me I can see but there you are in the water with me. Take my hand and guide me graciously. Will you come with me on this journey? With every breath we take, keep reaching for the dawn. I know alone I will fall. In your smile and the gentleness within your speech, you reassure me your love surrounds me. I know safety is at last within my reach. Will you come with me? Will you come with me on this journey? With every breath we take, keep reaching for the dawn. I know alone I will falter With a good friend near me I will carry on It's an illusion We carry with us As we wait on through the waters of our lives we must be 
strong and hold our own here. But a helping hand will save us by and by. Will you come with me? Will you come with me on this journey? With every breath we take, keep reaching for the dawn. I know alone that I will falter with a good friend near me. I will carry on. I know alone that I will falter with a good friend near me. I will carry on with a good friend near me. I will carry. On. Again, Joe, I want to thank, uh, as Joe did, Jessica and John and Marilyn and uh, Warren Dalkeith. Warren got a call during the service to go into work and it's got to keep our priorities straight. So Warren's not with us here now, but I want to thank you all for your participation in the service. <clears throat> Once again, I've extinguished the chalice here in the sanctuary. And I thank all those who attended the service today by Zoom or by YouTube. I'll say goodbye now to those who joined by YouTube as we end our live streaming. I hope that you'll take the message of beauty from today's service for the week ahead. And I hope that you'll check, I hope you'll check out Joe Jenks' website. Just search for Joe Jenks and maybe you'll even buy an album. <laughs>